Hello and welcome to this screencast lecture on defining your problem and your design requirements in an engineering project. So the first thing I should really say about this topic is that, to be honest, it's not the most fun part of the engineering design process. Uh, however, it is so crucial and it may even be the most important step because if it's not done right, the rest of the process will not be done right. Um, it's a lot more fun to brainstorm ideas for cool designs. You know, I'll be honest with you, that is a lot more exciting and it's what we're generally in a hurry to get to. Uh, and therefore, it is very tempting to give short shrift to this and try to get through uh, the problem definition phase as quickly as you can. Um, but it's very important to develop the discipline necessary uh, to force yourself to go through this in a methodical and careful way. Uh, and I call this the slow to solve principle. You have to spend at least some time at the beginning of the process as a team uh, really thinking through uh, how best to define your problem and how to establish your requirements before you've even begun to think about possible solutions. Now that's easier said than done. Almost every team I've been on, uh, in every project I've been on, I've had to fight this urge. It's so tempting to think, oh, you know, I, I, maybe we could do this or maybe we could do that. And then before you know it, the whole team is off on a tangent talking about it. And somebody's got to blow the whistle and say, whoa, get, get, you know, we're not supposed to be thinking about solutions here. Get back to defining the problem. It's okay. You know, we, we all, you know, sort of slip into that temptation, but you just really want to try um, to force yourself to stay on task and not think about solutions and police each other. Just, you know, don't be afraid to say, well, that sounds like a solution. So, you know, got to back up. Um, and then similarly, when it is time to think about solutions, we'll, in our ideation lecture, we'll talk about how it's also important to not be too quick to move on to the evaluation phase. Um, you know, when you're brainstorming, you don't want to be judging the, the quality of those solutions. Uh, so at every step of the process, it's important not to get ahead of yourself and start uh, working on the next step, even though it can be tempting. So when formulating the problem, uh, it, it's very important to think about what's the broadest reasonable way the problem can be described. Uh, obviously, there is a limit at some point. Um, to how broadly you can make it without having it lose all meaning or significance. But we really don't want to make it unnecessarily narrow uh, because that can bias your solution space later when we start trying to brainstorm ideas. Uh, for example, if you're trying to figure out how to coat the inside of a pipe, um, the superficial instinct might be, well, I'm you know, I'm trying to figure out how to get this coating on the interior surface of the pipe. So my problem is, how do how do I apply the coating? How do I deposit this coating uh, at the at this thickness? Um, you know, for this length, uh, etc. Um, but you've already gotten off on this path, this trajectory of assuming that the way you first conceived of the problem is the best way uh, and that it's not unnecessarily narrow. Uh, for example, you might want to step back and say, well, are we sure we need the pipe to be coated? Um, uh, is there perhaps a different material um, uh, that would obviate the need for a coating, or is there a surface finish that could be applied to the material either before or after um, uh, it's made into the pipe? Uh, as another example from my own work, uh, uh, my team was once trying to figure out how to get a sample of a biologic from a sterile biocontainer bag without opening up the bag and exposing its contents to the unsterile air. So we wanted to be able to get a sample, do some tests, but not compromise the sterility of the rest of the contents. And for a while, we were brainstorming on this while formulating it as how do we enter the bag to get a sample without compromising sterility? And we were coming up with all sorts of, you know, possible ideas, very complex, very intricate, um, you know, very cumbersome. 
and some of which uh, were variations of uh, other ideas. Uh, you know, you, there, are, there are mechanisms where there's positive air pressure so that when you open it up, uh, there's a source of, of, of air that's blowing out so that there's a net outflow and air can't, the, the unsterile air can't get inside, but you can still reach in and grab your sample. Um, there are other approaches uh, dealing with, with um, uh, things like moving parts that have really tight seals that are uh, still airtight and yet can move. And um, what we realized was we were defining the problem too narrowly because we didn't really care whether we, quote, entered the bag. Uh, we just cared whether we could extract a sample from the bag. And if there was a way to extract a sample from the bag without actually having to enter it um, in some way, uh, then that would be fine. And so when, once we changed that formulation to extracting a, ser a sterile sample without compromising sterility, um, it opened up a range of other possibilities. And for example, we were able to conceive of uh, the solution we ended up designing, which was to um, to create a series of small chambers on the end of the bag uh, into which we could flow a small portion of the contents uh, and then section off those small chambers on demand with heat sealing uh, and then they would be perforated so that after heat sealing they could be uh, torn off and, and severed from the main portion of the bag without ever having to have that main portion of the bag be exposed. So the the way you describe your problem, um, whether you consciously realize it or not, can um, can have a tremendous impact on the range of possible solutions that you're open to. So this feeds into a few concepts I just want to go over quickly. Uh, implied solutions uh, down here is uh, what we were just sort of talking about. Um, biases are um, when you consciously or subconsciously are assigning more weight to a particular aspect of the problem uh, than perhaps you should or than your teammates are. Uh, and it's okay to have biases as long as you are honest with yourself and your teammates about them so that you can talk through whether you're really putting the right emphasis uh, on the right aspects of the problem. Um, when we talk about evaluating uh, design ideas, we'll talk about how you assign different weights to the different criteria. And this is a way to help you and your team um, sort of all make sure you're on the same page as to how much weight you're assigning to different aspects of the problem and different possible aspects of different candidate solutions. Uh, errors are probably the simplest to deal with because that's objectively false, wrong information or incomplete information, and that's mainly a matter of doing your research.